Hello, hello. Welcome to What to Read Wednesdays, your go-to podcast for staff picks from your friends at Delaware County District Library. Here, we'll talk about books, podcasts, and other relevant media. I'm your host, Annie Pasma. Good morning, DCDL listeners. First of all, I would like to thank you for your cooperation as we go back to curbside service. Your safety is our number one priority, and we are so grateful for all of your support. Of course, as always, please contact us with any questions or concerns at askus at delawarelibrary.org, and you can go to www.delawarelibrary.org for our curbside hours at all of our branches. Um, And you can always call us, too, when we're open. If you have any concerns, just give us a call, and we'd be happy to talk to you. Some exciting news is that What to Read Wednesdays now has its very own email address. That's right. If you would like to send me suggestions or any kind of feedback, go ahead and send it to whattoread at delawarelibrary.org. So that's whattoread at delawarelibrary.org. I would love to hear from from you, uh, our listeners. And I think that um, in the future, I'm going to be doing a community pick podcast, like a episode every couple of months. So if you could send in your suggestions, I would love to hear what you're reading, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Honestly, I would just like to hear from you. How do you like the podcast? Suggestions, feedback, whatever. I really look forward to hearing from you. With that being said, let's talk about books. We'll start out today hearing from our most prolific guest, Mark. Hello. My name is Mark Stevens, and I work circulation at the Powell Branch. The book I'd like to recommend to you now is called Severance, and it's, the author is Ling Ma. That is spelled M-A. This book would be best for adult readers, especially those who are millennials. When this book was published in 2018, I doubt if the author realized how relevant it would be to the pandemic we are all facing now. Just as we are being forced to adapt to a new normal, so are the characters in this book, although on a much more apocalyptic scale. Readers of this book will find themselves wondering, what would I do if all of society's rules and conventions would break down? How would I survive if most of the world's population had died in a plague? Right off the bat, I want to stress this book is not a horror book filled with zombie-like characters. On the contrary, it's definitely more literary fiction. It's similar in tone to Station Eleven, a popular post-apocalyptic book published in 2014 you may have read. Another very popular book of this genre is the classic The Road by Cormac McCarthy, And this book is definitely less dark and painful than that book. Severance is generally slow moving and is basically a character study of 20-something Candace Shen, who emigrated with her parents as a young girl from China to New York City. The author flips back and forth from Candace's days in China from her adapting with her parents to American culture and from her aimless drifting in the months after her parents died. Most of the book deals with Candace as she is now, a lonely millennial unsure what she wants to pursue as a career and if she wants to continue her lukewarm relationship with her boyfriend, Jonathan. Okay, now that my introduction is done, I'd like to stress I really like this book. I'd give it 4.5 stars out of 5. It's won over 40 awards and was chosen as a Best Book of the Month for August 2018 by Amazon. I found Candace to be so interesting how she is 
kind of indifferent to her friends and life in general, but due to her need for order and control, becomes wed to a job she is good at, but pretty much totally dislikes. As society begins to collapse, it's eerie to watch her cling to her job, refusing to leave, even after most workers have fled the city to be with their families. The remaining skeletal staff diminishes by the week as Manhattan becomes a ghost town. But still, Candace remains dutifully trying to maintain email communications with the company's global concerns. As the Shen fever spreads, and that's what the virus is called, the Shen fever, you will find yourself turning the pages more quickly. No one is cured, and before they die from malnutrition, they are doomed to repeat a common routine of theirs, completely unaware of what they are doing. There is a great scene where a family goes through the motions of setting a table, eating non-existent food, and then clearing the table, never saying a word, but just staring blindly at each other. The action continues to build as Candace joins with a few other survivors whose cult-like leader has convinced them they must journey to a place called the Facility. Candace faces her greatest test of survival during this phase of the book. You will find yourself wondering why these few people seem to have immunity to the disease, and also if you'd actually want to be a survivor in this world. This is a book that stuck with me for several days after I read it. This book is well written, although the author does have a habit of avoiding quotation marks, which may bother some readers. I predict, though, that if you are a reader who likes slowly building action around a quirky, well-developed central character, you will like this book. It's only 304 pages, so it's a quick read, and it's available on Libby. I might add that I think this would be a great book for book groups to discuss. That sounds creepy, but great. (laughs) Thanks, Mark. Alex has been working at the Delaware Main Branch in Circulation for about a year now, and she would like to recommend some books she has reviewed as she pursues her degree in library science. Her first first, her first book recommendation is Vincent and Theo, The Van Gogh Brothers by Deborah Hagelman. Vincent and Theo, the Van Gogh brothers, explores the lifelong correspondence of the brilliant Vincent Van Gogh and his lesser-known brother Theo. This biography interweaves the highs and lows, the mania and the depression that follows their dysfunctional lives. This is a non-fiction title and is appropriate for adults and teens. Another title which she enjoyed, and which is a read-alike, is Jay McCullough's blood water paint. When Artemisia Gentilici came to be age 12, she had a life-altering choice. Would she become a nun and live in a convent, or would she follow in her father's footsteps to become a painter? Along her road to greatness, she is assaulted by the painter her father has chosen to tutor her. How can Artemisia speak out at a time where women have no voice? At age 17, she she is one of the most talented painters within Rome, although she is not recognized. Artemisia realizes she must fight for herself as well as for her art. Her words come to life through beautiful poetry in both free verse and prose. Those interested in art, the Renaissance era, and strong women will enjoy this novel. Nonfiction and historical fiction are some of my favorite genres, and these sound really great. I am so excited to introduce you to our next guest. You may not know that libraries would not, could not function without a very special department, the Technical Services Department. They have an endless list of jobs, including putting jackets on our books, 
labeling them correctly, putting stickers on spines, cleaning DVDs, making sure the new books go to the right branch, and a whole host of things that, honestly, I know nothing about. We all benefit greatly from the technical services, <clears throat> us as staff and you as patrons. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Reggie Powell. No relation to the Powell branch. <laughs> anyway, sorry, terrible joke. Reggie recommends the newest book by Max Brooks. Max Brooks, author of World War Z, has a brand new book out that is sure to grab your sense of terror and adventure and drag you into parts unknown. It is called Devolution and stars none other than Bigfoot. It is told as a documentary based on a diary found in an eco-community that has been cut off from the world by the explosion of the volcano at Mount Rainier. Apparently, this small community is trying to survive the isolation only to discover that they are not alone. The book is very well written, and you can't help but want to read it until the end. Another masterpiece for Max Brooks. Reggie is one of the most fun people to talk to about books. I love walking into the break room to see her just avidly reading. And it is ridiculous how widely read Reggie is. She can't be pigeonholed. So I love talking books with Reggie. Moving on, we are next going to be hearing directly from Jenny at the Orange Branch. Hi, this is Jenny from the Orange Branch Library. Um, I have a few very different books to share today. Uh, the types of books I tend to enjoy most often are classic detective fiction, horror, narrative nonfiction, and um, quirky yet poetic literary fiction. There really isn't a genre of books I won't try, so my reading tends to vary a lot and be entirely dependent on my mood and what type of book I'm craving at the moment. The first book I wanted to recommend um, is Grady Hendrick's newest. Uh, it's called The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Grady Hendrix has written a handful of horror novels, um, like My Best Friend's Exorcism, which is an ode to the 1980s, Female Friendship, and Demonic Possession, and a Horror Store, which is a novel about a haunted Ikea. Now, this novel is sort of a mashup of Steel Magnolias and Dracula, packed with 90s nostalgia. Um, our main character, Patricia, is a housewife with an overwhelming to-do list, a distant husband, um, and some ungrateful kids. The one thing she looks forward to is going to book club, where Patricia and the other mothers discuss true crime and suspenseful fiction. When an attractive but mysterious stranger moves into their neighborhood, Patricia instantly connects with the man, but soon begins to suspect that he is not all he seems. Children have been going missing, and his behavior is strange. Patricia and the book club ladies have to use their knowledge of true crime to investigate, but they soon discover that they're the only people who can stop this monster devouring their unsuspecting community. I really love the blend of humor and horror with a nod to true, true crime in this one. Um, his stories often jump from really funny uh, dialogue uh, to really scary um, suspenseful, sus uh, suspenseful moments um, to just like horrifying violence, like sometimes in a single page. So you really never know what's coming next. Um, I would say this one is most similar to um, the, the Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule, even though it's a totally different genre. Um, it has a lot of the same elements um, and a lot of the same types of, of characters um, in the story. And now for something completely different. Um, my second recommendation is one of my favorite authors, perhaps lesser known books. Um, it's called Last Night in Twisted River. This novel is by John Irving, um, who is most well known for writing The Cider House Rules, The World According to Garp, and my personal favorite, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, really though, I love all of his books. Um, I really wanted to recommend this one because it's not one that people usually mention. Um, some people might've missed it. And I really think it's worth the, uh, same attention as some of his other more well-known titles. Um, it takes place, um, beginning in 1954, um, in a logging settlement in Northern New Hampshire. Um, uh, there's, uh, the cook, Dominic and his 12 year old son, Danny. Now Danny one night mistakenly, um, believes that the local constable's girlfriend is a bear now, this misconception leads to a really unfortunate accident, and both Danny and his father have to become fugitives, endlessly pursued by the relentless and vengeful constable. Their lone protector is a fiercely libertarian logger who befriends them. 
And near the end of the novel, John Irving writes, we don't always have a choice how we get to know one another. Sometimes people fall into our lives cleanly, as if out of the sky, or as if there were a direct flight from heaven to earth. The same sudden way we lose people, who once seemed they would always be part of our lives. What's fascinating about Irving as a writer is that he often begins his writing process by deciding on the final sentence of his novels, and then he decides to work backwards from there, propelling his characters and plot on a journey to that final sentence as if it is a final destination. His colorful characters will become so real by the final pages that you will feel forever tethered to them and find yourself recalling again and again, and again that last night in Twisted River. I really love his novels. Um, they're always very provocative. Um, they're heartbreaking, full of eccentric characters um, that are flawed, strange, and just feel like people that you might you might know. Um, I really like that his novels focus on relationships. Um, in this case, the fierce love um, between a father who's desperate to protect his son as they're thrown into dangerous circumstances. Some read-alikes for this one would be The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna and The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, which is another book I really, really highly recommend. Last but not least, I have um, a nonfiction book I wanted to recommend. This one took me by surprise. Um, it's a book called um, The Stranger in the Woods, The Extraordinary Story of the Last True Hermit by Michael Finkel. Um, it's a biography. Um, it follows the fascinating story that became public in 2013 after a string of break-ins in a main campsite led to the capture of a mysterious and unknown man. Local officials discovered that this man's name was Christopher Knight, and he had been living in the woods, evading detection for 27 years. Now, the biography tells um, the full story of Christopher Knight, um, as told to um, by Christopher Knight himself, um, to our writer. Um, he decided one day in 1986 to walk into the main woods, simply to live in total isolation, um, until he emerged following his arrest in 2013. To the nearby campers, he was the real-life boogeyman. But to Christopher, he was simply living the way he wanted to live, completely and utterly alone. Now, this might be the most on-the-nose quarantine and social isolation recommendation I can come up with right now. Um, when I read it last summer, I mean, I definitely, I, it was very interesting to read because there was so much appeal to, like, the quiet life in, in, in solitude in the woods, but I don't think I could handle um, that level of social isolation. Um, so it's interesting. I would like to know what people think um, if they choose to read this at this time when we're all feeling a little bit more socially isolated than normal. Um, so I'm always intrigued by news stories that are stranger than fiction and like these in-depth character studies. This one definitely checked those boxes. Um, it was recommended by a fellow outdoorsy librarian, Denise. Um, so I gave it a shot and was instantly hooked. Um, I just really became fascinated by all the details of Christopher's survival in the woods, um, including surviving through some of the harshest winters on, on record. Um, the debate over his arrest and sentencing and the way the biography just really explored um, themes of like introversion, human nature, um, um, a human being's connection to nature and the chaos of modern life um, as compared with that serenity of nature. Um, the closest read-alike for this one would probably be Into the Wild um, by John Krakauer. Um, similar themes there too about kind of going off into the wilderness to be to be alone. Um, but yeah, I, I really hope that you enjoy um, one or all of these books. Uh, maybe check them out if they sound interesting to you. But uh, happy reading. Take care. Awesome recommendations, Jenny. Thank you so much for contributing. Okay, folks, that's all we have for today. I hope you and your family are all safe and healthy and continue to be so. As always, please contact us if you have any questions. Go on our website to see what's coming up next and for other announcements. In the meantime, I'm your host, Annie Pasma. Thanks for listening.